Yes, but no worries. All right, so started the stream here on Facebook and on uh, Periscope and Twitch. So if people are tuning in, um, thanks for joining us tonight. People with a passions live streaming with friends. We're being joined from the Northern Territory tonight by Rod Bramlett, who is the coaching director for Basketball Northern Territory. Um, he's a high performance coach, works with uh, skilled athletes um, as an extension of the AIS program, which is the intensive training type centres. Do they still call it the intensive training centre program? What's the name? Uh, it's called the high performance program now. Yep. So, so what does that entail? What does high performance mean there, uh, Rod? Yeah, well, it's kind of varies a little bit from state to state, to be honest with you. Um, for us, it's... Um, an identification and invitation program of our best kids um, that come in. Uh, they work on sessions on court between four and six times a week. A um, couple of those are on courts and a couple of strength and conditions. Um, and, yeah, the role is our uh, mantra is uh, quality people that we're trying to develop and player excellence. So that's our mantra. It's pretty broad reaching, but plan is to try and improve young players on court in any way we can. So if uh, there's athletes that are across Australia, there's a number of these state programs, and I've got you on tonight to make sure the NT is represented. So NT represent. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for being here. I need here. a soft spot for the NT, uh, having worked here and been here before, and you, you got to know our landscape, which is always nice to talk to southern-based people that have kind of had uh, an involvement here because they do understand some of the intricacies in Northern Territory and how it is with the diversity um, of players we have, but also the sparseness in our population. Yeah, so there are some challenges there, and we'll bring those up. Um, we'll give the back backstory. So I've known of Rod, and known Rod for be almost 20 years, so our interactions were 2000 our first interactions um were actually i was operations manager and helped um run and operate the darwin basketball association for a short period of time before deciding it wasn't for me and then ended a job to his family business which was a promotional product and inventory company which still is today um run by uh rod's wife and uh, mother-in-law so i believe yep so right. that business um is still powering which is good but that's the the, the backstory so we have known it. we haven't really stayed connected up until probably we bumped into each other at the ais there coaching uh coaching conference a couple of years back so that was a good catch-up and you just taken on the role so let's talk a little bit about basketball and the role that you assume there um how long have you been in that role now uh so I started in uh, 2016, um, but prior to that, I'd been a network coach in the old ITC uh, days or ITP. Uh, it's gone through a few names. So I've probably been involved in some way or another with the performance program here for 25 years. Um, did my level one coaching course under the tutelage of Doug Garvey, which might be a name that Queenslanders know, um, back in the four which is going to make me sound terrifically old, but um, basically got involved with the sport um, through uh, my wife's um, family's involvement in the sport. I was from rugby league, AFL cricket background, um, playing all those things uh, at various levels, juniors and uh, seniors. And then you actually go down and watch Jody play. He played in the league competition here. And um, I seemed to be bobbing up too often. And then one day someone said, we are here all the time. Would you be interested in coaching an under-10 team? And I quickly said, well, I've, I'm not a basketballer. I don't, I don't play basketball. And they said, oh, you don't have to. And from that day on, I, I was kind of already hooked. I used to go down to the courts and back they used to have a Super League. Um, and there's a young man here called uh, Timmy Duggan um, who went on to play in the NBL. Um, and I was just mystified by the, the talent he showed on the court and that kind of sparked an interest for me I used to go down and watch Jody play and then stay on and watch the, the men's Super League and, and watch Timmy play. I was just amazed by his skill and talent and whatever else. And so I kind of got the bug and I was super keen to be involved. Um, and I'm just one of those people that if I set him to do something, I, I kind of want to do it to the best of my ability, whether it's coaching an under 10 team or um, I was a, 
I was a an auditor with Ernst and Young. Um, I have an accounting background. Um, so yeah, so I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to make sure the kids get the best possible experience out of if I'm going to be the coach. And yeah, so I just went and went to everything I could, spoke to everyone I could about the game, watched as much as I could, and got involved in, in the ITC program. But coach going down, watching, and someone asked me to jump on court and just, just help. And, um, then uh, 27 years later, kind of here I am. Um, but I've been involved as a network coach and senior network coach with the, the high performance programs and groups for a long time. And, um, you know, an extension of that for us up here is, um, you know, Australian Jew Championships where a lot of the kids are in, you know, make both given the small kind of sample size we have to choose from at times. So, you know, I've coached at, I think, 16 or 17 national championships now. Um, so, yeah, got involved there, love the national championship experience for us as junior development coaches, kind of the closest thing we get to being a professional coach uh, the day, a volunteer, and just love that, got the bug for it. And, yeah, so um, uh, here I am 20-odd, 20 27 years later uh, in the role. Um, the interesting thing from the outside being a volunteer, looking in, you always kind of would ask, oh, why can't they do that and why aren't they doing that? And, rah, rah, and from the outside, you think, oh, this should be easy. You should. Once I got in the role, <laughs> I started. Those things weren't as simple as they uh, once seemed and uh, understood some of the challenges that uh, uh, go into, you know, developing a really good high-performance program. So um, it's been a, it's been a challenge. I loved it. I mean, lucky I'm one of these people that gets up, be like yourself, I'm sure, loves what he does and loves knowing today's a new day and a new challenge and you love what you're doing and love to jump out of bed and get stuck in and keep learning and have a so yeah, that's kind of kind of where I'm at. I feel really fortunate and blessed to be paid to do something I really love. So I'm, I feel really fortunate in that regard. Yeah, that's an awesome, awesome journey too for someone who isn't, you know, has got the bug for basketball and ended up being a high performance coach in the board, having never um, played. But you're not bad at shooting now because there's a lot of time spent on court in a development <laughs> role, mate. So you're yeah, always fine. A lot of my a lot of my closest mates weren't basketballers either, and there was a period of time where we, uh, you know, put a men's division three team together, and it was horrific. Uh, <laughs> being in the role I am now, and thinking back to how we played, and I just shake my head, and my wife used to shake her head every uh, every week after we come off the court because we thought we were kind of together, but we we're playing in the division four comp in. Darwin, uh, you imagine a lot of footy players in the basketball uh, scene in the Division 4, so you can imagine the kind of uh, quality that you got to see each week. But it was good fun, I loved it, and um, having those times as a you know as someone who wasn't from the sport and getting out there, re- it really helped me understand you know, and appreciate the quality of you know athlete that plays our sport, and um, obviously having the opportunity now to be more and more exposed uh, you know, over the years to young athletes at the AIS, and Getting to go and uh, involved at a you know at a pro level and um, you know and then I got the opportunity um, last year to, to coach the Australian under 18 3x3 boys team which was kind of the pinnacle of my career thus far and um, just being able to see how our kids can our best kids can adapt and play and you know apply themselves um, it's kind of really inspiring um, as, as a coach so I, I was kind of always that driven kind of guy that. I want my athletes to get the best out, best out of what we do. Um, I've got to get the game on the work myself as well. Uh, no worries, mate. So I'm just having a look here. Um, Jody has joined the chat, my, my people with a passion. So um, if for those who are joining us and joining us late, we're with Rod Tremlett, who is actually the Basketball MT uh, High Performance Coaching Director, so in charge of the development of junior athletes athletes looking to potentially you know step on a professional uh, career at some stage. the best of the best of the nt is who we're with and um shout out to those that have joined us here so shout out to jody it's been some time i i don't have much hair these days <laughs> <laughs> so so, so uh yeah so i don't think i ever had much hair then in the sense i always shaved it anyway so I probably don't look that much different <laughs> Shout out to Ivan, who's a, a stalwart of uh, support here and um, people with a passion. So um, we also had Jaron Jameson uh, log in there, uh, basketballer himself. We've got Jordan Dean, who's the local 
athlete who is a uh, player here, so he did a little bit of um, his the rap, rap programs at one of our, or two of our associations he's played for, and he's yeah. coming along quite well, and he's at a school that I was meant to go chat by COVID. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> nah. yeah. Well, that's been a that's been a journey in itself. Ron Jamison actually, uh, we flew with him potentially from the the QPL um, recently, where he where he went really really well um, at North Cold Coast Seahawks. Just the talent he played in our. Um, we've had the last two years. We've had pro three three teams uh, involved in the um, Drex three hustle NBL stuff. Um, and Jerome played in our men's team, which I which I coached the year before uh, COVID, and uh, is a talent, great guy, terrific um, kind of bloke for the sport with kids off the court and coaches a lot of kids and. Um, yeah, he's uh, so he's he mentioned he was gonna gonna join us, and uh, it was a bizarre situation. We were down at uh, in Melbourne at the Australian Grand Prix three x three event um, recently, and uh, you know it was a bizarre time. We were stacked up outside the the entry gate to mm-hmm. to get in because the uh, court the three x three court actually on site at the Australian Grand Prix, and uh, like everyone, no one knew what was going on right on that you know cusp of what's going on or things being cancelled and you know probably the three three or four thousand people all at this gate standing shoulder to shoulder you know and in the end uh, the, as we know the australian grand prix got cancelled but we were actually allowed to go on track be, um and start the tournament the uh the pro hustle there we had and um yeah we got two games in and then um people came over and said listen we're shutting the whole the whole place down um, so we, uh, yeah, the organisers who were great, you know, um, the NBA hustle guys did a terrific job that came and said, look, do you guys want to keep playing or do you want to just call it? And we'd flown from Darwin, you know, we'd mm. done trainings and everything down there and our guys are like, well, hell, we're, 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 we're good to play. Um, so yeah, we, um, they organised the, the tournament to be, uh, continued at MSAC. So we literally walked down to MSAC, put our gear down, nose taters, whatever else, and, uh, finished the tournament and then kind of stuck in melbourne for a couple of days and just the uneasiness to work out what it, what is this all about now yeah. we've come so far in such a short period of time haven't we you know mm. so it was a it was a strange 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 time yeah so everyone was thrown for six i know that um it, here in queensland everything was just slower to to wind down and 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 very confusing even with the the picking back up in the stages here in our state um a lot of confusion around you know the, the the it's just hard it's contradictory so you know we got situations where schools are being told for their athlete like their programs that they're only going to have 100 people after the 11th of july um in the venue when the venue is like you know there might be a court upstairs and one downstairs and and the buildings as long as you know the stretch of road that it's on and and mm. saying that is one building and you're only allowed 100 in that building but on a daily basis they've got 25 kids in each class in every class in that building <laughs> it's like it's yeah. a, so they've got one rule for this and one rule for that that's okay but not in this instance so and while you try to do the right thing it just doesn't make sense <laughs> So yeah, and it's, it's a bit confusing for people. And you're right, and you know, uh, for me, kind of as as you may know, we're we're back to full play on Monday, um, up here in Darwin. Um, but we've just gone through a period of our last four weeks in high performance uh, in May, where you know, we were able to get our kids outside to do their strength and conditioning um, sessions, and then the last two weekends we were able to um, able to get on court, which is for you know for the first time for some time, and. You know, I just thought I'd never been in a situation where I was sanitising basketballs before mm. kids came in, you know, through the doors and that to practice and hand sanitizer, um, no scrimmaging, no, you know, even then and, and you know, then, you know, the kids, because they're like, well, at school we're playing Red Rover and we're, you know, running around and, you know, we're right next to each other and we're sitting right next to each other in class. And I guess from a perspective from basketball where it has been really good, it's, it's just a matter of, I guess, trying to get through the stages, adhering to the minimisation stuff, because we don't want to be, you know, the sport that says, oh, we didn't take this stuff seriously and now we're, you know, everything's gone back again. But it's just a crazy time. And, it, you know, and I feel for the kids. I mean, I'm just so proud of our high-performance kids. We did about 40 sessions over Zoom, um, two strategies and two, um, two ball-handling shooting sessions. And, you know, it's tough for a young kid. I mean, we had about three weeks to go to the under-18 nationals. And those kids have been training their guts out for three to four months. You know, it's devastating for them. 
from. You know, it really is, and you really feel for them. Um, so for them to kind of pick up, pick it up, and keep pushing through, and that, you know, really, really proud of them. Um, our group is our attendance was fantastic, and um, it's a testament to them. You know, like a, a yeah, it's a lot of credit for a young person to be able to do that. It's not easy. One of the things that when I was in Darwin, I identified and in, um, in coaching the boys' high schools teams at nationals was that your preparation is a lot harder than anywhere else because you don't get the games that everyone else is getting in other states. Now, I haven't been there for over 17 years. Is that still a problem for you guys? Like, is there a look? Yeah. You know, the game, you guys arrive at a nationals and these these kids that are at nationals are playing like school representative um representative they're playing multiple associations because they're available to they're across all these associations Mm. and and when you guys arrive and i know from my experience you just um you don't have the game preparation that these other athletes have so is there anything that you have tried there in the nt to try and give Uh, kids more game experience or is it just the remoteness makes it a challenge and absolutely i mean with We've tried some things like uh, about two years ago, we had our high performance kids in the men's league comp, our boys, um, and that certainly helped. There was a mixture of 18s and 16s, but we kind of favoured the 18s in the first half of the season, then the 16s. We've obviously got that. We've got a bit of an issue with 14, 15 year old boys going up against grown men um, at the steam levels, but at 18s, it was great. Um, but we're in a situation at the moment where our 18s kids that are in high performance are, you know, playing minutes in the <laughs> league comp. Mm-hmm. And if we pull those kids out of there, yeah, um, you know, well, one first clubs get a bit antsy about it because, you know, they, especially in a championship season, they they want the clubs to perform and do and some of these kids are their best players. So it's really hard. Um, we've we've certainly tried to um, influence the what we do at for 18s prep in particular, to try and get all-star um, league men's teams to come. And we're lucky in a way that as whilst we're a domestic comp, we do have a, a rough uh, imports that um, are, re- are pretty good quality imports. Um, so to get our boys trying to play against them is something we're trying to do more often. But then you know we have to be really careful because if they're injured playing in a game against our boys and they're there for their clubs and, you know, so it is really, really hard, mate. And that's not to mention, um, you know, if we've got some Alice Springs kids that are in the NT team, mm. you know, it's it's a it's a fifteen hundred dollar exercise to bring a Alice kid to Darwin for a weekend. Yeah. Um, we just don't have that sort of coin, unfortunately. Um, so you know, we have a camp the week before we go. We have a selection camp now, which is something I've changed. So if an Alice kid is selected from a trial in Alice, they now come to Darwin and they're all on the same court for three days trialing and coaches then are just to you know we say to our coaches look you need to get some stuff in whilst it is also a trial you know yeah, try and yeah. change a bit of what we do so we're getting the selection piece done but we're also getting some of the um foundations in for what the team's going to run and do so you kind of got to think on your feet but absolutely the level of quality games that not even as rep teams but it even just our kids get to play week in, week out is absolutely our biggest challenge. Um, so, and it's a tough one, you know, and this has been a ca- the case since I've been coaching nationals, you know, for the last 15, 17 years. Um, and then we also have some kids that are away at boarding school that are eligible for selection for the NT because their parents still live here. So then you throw them in and it's just, a, <laughs> it's hmm. just tough. It is really tough. I, um, but what do you do? I know with my experience, I had a couple of athletes in Alice, a couple in Nullumboy, and we weren't coming together before heading to a Nationals until, like for two days, going out of Darwin. That was there. Other than sending out programs that the coaches in those regions, the teachers that were working with them had to do, um, they'd arrive. And, and I remember training, our trainings working on defense i had rubbish bins numbered all around the perimeter to work on like a shell drill where wherever i called the number was the ball and the players had to adjust and you had to yeah. come up with some really creative approaches to try and make yeah, sure absolutely. they were prepar- prepared and um it was a it was a challenge and i remember it and it was an eye-opener because i came from actually my big eye-opener was when i arrived and they had what i consider the stupid dive um <laughs> In the league, do you? I, I've heard that on, and I don't know how long ago it was removed. What's, so they, what, that, what, the top, the top five, five and the top. Do you remember 
league they had this is in the 2001 i think it was um they had they had to stipulate who their top five players were and if you oh, were in the top yeah, five yeah, or top three you could play yeah. league reserve or a and i've arrived and yeah. i got i think i went through three clubs before i wasn't put in their top and, and they, they changed it i complained because i'm like how because i came from a situation where i was playing um rep i was playing multiple games a week. like i don't think there was a night yeah. i wasn't playing or training and and, and i arrive yeah. and they're telling me i can only play one game a week and i'm, I'm like what you know, yeah. like, you, you know, and then they dropped it to top three and, and I was trying to scrape my way. I went, I think I went, yeah, I went from yeah, Ans- I was saying, Ansel. Those, those are gone. Yeah, Thank I was going to say. Um, uh, yeah, it was counterintuitive. I thought I ended up refing. That's yeah. how desperate I was to maintain fitness. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> look, mate, you know, it's bad. We've got a player who, who doesn't care for refing, putting his hand up just to maintain fitness because they just, I it, it, uh, couldn't understand it. I couldn't believe it when I was told that. But um, thank goodness it's gone. So some yeah. wiser heads there. Yeah. So the yeah. other thing that intrigued right. me, I couldn't work out. I was getting confused by the court when I first arrived um, and yeah. the length of court. But I understand they've had modifications to the um, to the main complex, the Spectrum it was called yep. then. I don't know if it's still called the Spectrum. Yeah. So, Kerry, oh, so yeah, um, so oh, was there three courts? When you uh, were no, it was three they were building. Um, I moved out of the way as manager and more, uh, Paul, I think, came in as the uh, general manager. So they were building the courts, started building the two oh. courts. And I got to play and ran my basketball camp there in the two courts. It was built when I left. So, yeah, so I, was, I was from um, 2001 to 2000 and uh, end 2000. So right. started 2001. Yeah, well, those wood courts, kind of the the two, uh, you know, league and whatever else, uh, you know. And it's funny now we talk to league players and they're like, oh, I'm not playing out in those back courts. And there was a time where we didn't have the back courts. Um, and now, um, yeah, particularly with Kerry Savage, uh, some of the work she's done with the DBA now. There's been extensions to the spectrum now that they are the proper size because they were also short. Um, so they're the proper size now. A heap of the grands on one end have, have gone to make sure the court is the right dimensions, which is fantastic. Um, there's moves afoot to air condition out the back now as well. Um, so which will be a huge difference for you know, so that all the members get to you know play in the air condition courts. So the, they kind of got the big louvers you probably remember yes. for airflow, and now yeah. they've got the glass fans. So they've made a huge difference. Um, and right now, actually, as we speak, they're doing work on um, on change rooms for uh, for court one as a show court um, because there's murmurings of uh, uh, NBL one uh, happening up here, and it is murmurings at the moment. Uh, but it's obviously all of up here. We we just understand that you know the local population here, the large majority of them have never seen a game higher than the standard of Darwin mm-hmm. competition haven't seen the NBL one, they haven't seen the NBL. Uh, and for us to kind of, my, my big challenge now, obviously, is just trying to influence coaches and players to kind of take a more professional approach to everything they're doing. But when they're not exposed to the full pathway, um, it's hard to convince parents and kids and coaches to up their level uh, because they haven't seen the next level, if you know what I mean. Yes, yeah. So some of the NBL one, for, for, for the, it'll be a Darwin team, which Northern Territory access, the Alice guys will get access. We just got to get a decent business plan and money behind us and there's some moves to put there. That'll change the landscape of basketball for Northern Territory considerably. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, now, now the quality of games you're going to see, the quality of imports that come in and you know, you've got to take kids out of our high-performance program them and drop an AMBL one academy with you know and perhaps they complement that with some scholarships and CDU. So then all of a sudden the whole landscape of you know of basketball changes. Um, so that's kind of been a dream for a long time to be honest uh, to kind of be able to see it through, through to fruition. Um, AFLNT had the had the thunder uh, here with the AFL stuff and that's kind of folded now for seniors. Um, they still have a junior AFL program. Uh, Thunder program, um, but I just think for us, kind of you know facilities that we're upgrading and new facilities that could potentially come on board, like time's right for us to you know. And with the NBL one just being established, I feel like if we don't kind of get it done in the next couple of years, we might miss the boat. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the NBL has been really gone the three side of things. They're supportive of us. We had the Pro Hustle final up here as part of the Arrow Fury Games last year, you know, and that was live on Fox Sports. That was a really big deal. So uh, the NBL have to us. We'd love to have you guys in. We want you in, but we need the business model, you know, as yeah. come in for a year or two and then the thing folds. Um, so, yeah, we'll start some work. You think our uh, our venue will be completely and utterly up to scratch? And uh, I got to coach with uh, uh, Brady Wormsley uh, for the last couple of seasons at Gladstone. Um, I did a bit of his uh, pre-game scouting stuff here for him, and then I tried to get down there once or twice a year and um, on game days and you know, stayed with his family. And he gave great insight into you know the NBL like what was the QBL then and kind of what was required and yep. the time and effort that was put into recruiting and scouting and that kind of stuff. So, um, and we were supposed to be going around again, but he's, uh, his tenure, uh, he was relieved of his tenure there at Gladstone. For me, it was a huge shame. Um, but, um, yeah, I learned a lot from him and, you know, um, just getting that exposure at the next level was, was fantastic for me. So um, I think I've got a pretty good insight now into what it's going to take you know, for us to get an NBA one or two team and going men's and women's. Uh, and that's, that's kind of on the drawing board. That's good because you're giving a vision to something that there has been a lot of vision and, and things for an NBL team, but it is a huge task because of the population up there. And there has been yeah. talk, like I know I spoke with Big Joe, who's a good mate of yours, and um, yes. shout out to Joe if you're watching there in your hospital bed because he's just had an operation. So That's shout right. out to yeah, him. Shout out to Big Joe. So. He's, uh, he's going really well. I saw a little bit of footage there on uh, Insta and he's up and trot, trotting around already. So, uh, yeah, fantastic to see him up and around. His journeys, as you know from what you did with him, uh, has been incredible. And that's kind of the last bit of his uh, journey in terms of uh, – Working out his his health issues and his body and everything else. So is that that story is an unbelievably inspiring story. It is an unbelievably <laughs> inspiring story. So um, if you're joining us, tonight's guest on live streaming with friends is Rod uh, Tremlett. Now Rod is the Northern Territory or basketball NT coaching director, head of high performance there with um, their high performance program and. Uh, we're talking about all things development in regional and remote area more than anything else because it is a different perspective. Now, if you haven't checked out people with a passion before, I do a number of uh, interviews live, which is night's episode, the live stream with friends, and also pre-recorded. So I've got 35 episodes. I'm in the of uh, getting more guests right now. So if you're a person with a passion that actually wants to, uh, you know, share your passion with the world, then this is a call out out to you if you want to guest on the pre-recorded version of the show then by all means i would welcome you to reach out to me through the people with a passion facebook page if you're on facebook right now i um, really appreciate if you start a watch party or share this to your friends so we can get a massive audience and also if you haven't already done so and you're here for the first time make sure you hit that people with a passion facebook page uh, like button and also if you're on youtube tonight we are on youtube twitter um, Twitch and Vimeo and I keep going Facebook. Um, so <laughs> all those platforms. Uh, so if you are on any of those, make sure you follow or subscribe to those. Um, really would appreciate that. Now to Brady Woolley, he is actually someone I interviewed on People with a Passion around the Wormsley Advantage around leadership. So moving into the leadership space. So mutual friend there, and um, he is mm. quite an intriguing individual when you actually talk to him about his uh, journey and his his aspirations to teach on leadership and he's demonstrated that through his coaching that he certainly has those abilities and he's obviously been a mentor for you so that's shout out to him if he sees this um he he has had one of the more popular videos if you haven't seen that one rod go up and check it out because it is up on people with a passion on the youtube channel so um but let's talk a little bit about this so mbl1 sounds awesome it's a great vision um, and there has been a vision, even though I was there for an NBL team, which is a monetary, it had, like you say, NBL is interested, but the business model has to be there. One of the things that's been suggested, and this is where I started to bring up Joe, is he was talking when he was there, he was looking into it, and he believed that for it to work, it probably has to be an Asian-type team 
that's potentially playing out of Darwin that, that has a mix of... So there's an Asian market. It's not just a, necessarily a Darwin team. What are your thoughts to that concept of opening up? To- yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, it, I think so. I mean, the reality is um, uh, we've got a massive Filipino population here uh, in Darwin and the Arafura Games gold medal game where the Territory men played the Philippines or eight from the Philippines. Uh, it was the biggest crowd at a basketball game, my memory. Uh, with grandstands full, the whole court was completely surrounded and we had 700 people outside. Um so uh, we know there's a following. The Filipino market here, they're right, they have their own league here. Um, so we know there's some passion for the sport here as well. Um, population is going to be an issue for us, um, you know, because for, me, for to us to sustain an NBL team, you're probably going to need, you know, three to 5,000 people every week, week in, week out. Now, you know, with the passion for Aussie rules here, which is kind of the roost in, in this town, you know, when the Thunder were close to kind of finishing, they were getting three, four hundred people to the TO Stadium that holds fourteen thousand people. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's the concern. Um, you know, it would have to have significant investment from a significant backer or two um, to to kind of justify. Um, and then it's just hard with the, the population size you have. I mean, for me, I think NBL one is the next step. Um, where a significant backer could really bankroll the team for a season, um, and um, you, where you're not relying on gate, you know, to to get up. Um, so I think the NBL one at this time anyway is um, is more, more realistic. Um, the Northern Territory population is declining at the moment, um, so you know, for us to maintain our participation levels is is a terrific job. Um, so to try and get you know, an increase and then an increase following in the sport in a declining population seeing a challenge um so that's where you know we still have the venue we've got a fantastic convention center down at the waterfront now that would be a magnificent spot for for an nbl team to play out of no doubt mm-hmm. um but it's it does come back to the numbers and the money um and that's where the challenge is kind of right now i think i think that um the, the test, too, could be that maybe they need to run some pre-season stuff up there um, a lot more mm. and, or, and and at least give them the experience. Like you say, people don't necessarily understand or know what it's like because they haven't experienced it. So yeah. maybe maybe throwing in like they do with, with... I think they did run a blitz there, actually. they Did they run the yeah, blitz there? Yeah, did a blitz. every team there, which was terrific. Yeah. Um, it was at our, you know, obviously our smaller venues yeah, where you wouldn't wouldn't play an NBA game out of out of the venues we currently have. We used to have the Perth Wildcats here. I don't know if they came up in your time over at Marara Indoor Stadium, which holds about eleven or twelve hundred um, there, which is great for a preseason game, absolutely. But you'd need a bigger venue than that, you know, that could hold that kind of really three, four, five thousand, you know, um, instantly. Um, that's the challenge. I mean, I. We would all love to see an NBL team out of Darwin, but um, I think that's probably a little further down the line, um, particularly after seeing the NBL one experience. And, you know, the, the other thing that I found really interesting with my involvement at Gladden was, you know, that, that team was largely brought in, men's and women. They weren't Gladstone people. And it'd be really interesting to see how kind of the, the Darwin population would react if it wasn't a team full of, Darwin people, which to be competitive, to be honest, yeah, exactly. it, it just couldn't be all Darwin guys. But definitely, we need to have the locals involved, and how the Darwin population, basketball community would respond to that would be is going to be really interesting thing to see. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah, you know, like I say, the people population here just hasn't been exposed to it. So, even in your head around that kind of concept is quite different territory basketball followers. Yeah. Um, so that would be really interesting to see. We've got um, a few shout outs. So I'll get you. Did you manage to share your the stream at all on your device? It, it, was that something you managed I to do? I watched Big Joe and I felt like he was on his phone the entire time he was talking to you. And <laughs> I didn't want to be that guy. 
Yeah, no, um, no, I know he's a popular young fella, and he's actually he's popular on social media as him. I will, I will come back to the question that's been handed to okay. me. I have a producer now, so so okay. I'll, I'll throw that one aside. That one's from Big Joe, and he's hollering at mine. So so we're going to get to your question, Big Joe. Give us a break. Okay. So shout outs, shout outs to Max Serve and Cheryl Bagri and uh, Benita McLeod, who are all joining us. Jessica Cluner, who who has joined the last couple of weeks. Um, we've got. Uh, Someone, I think it's oh, Nita saying Brady is a legend, and um, Big Joe's telling us I'm watching, and that was probably in a creepy voice. So <laughs> <laughs> I think Big Joe, I think, I think, I think, I, think I could just visualize him going, oh, I'm watching. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. He was like doing the old <laughs> point and the fingers and everything. So, no, he has this question, and you don't have to look. I'm going to say you don't have to answer this because it involves the vape. I'm open, mate. Shoot away. It's just there's a rule, you know, what happens in vegas stays in vegas so this is a vegas question and um, i got absolutely um steamrolled by joey Wright um with that re- that uh recruiting um, story. answer he gave which i happened to click on after coming home from a night out and i, I got to get on the passion thing and got on and that conversation was going just as came on board so i got oh, absolutely stitched up there so yes but let's let's see so, so so this is a story that obviously happened in Vegas, and he wants to. He said, "Ask you about the Vegas pool." So what's he talking okay. about? Yeah, so I, I'm happy to share that one because it uh, it it is a, it's a good story. I don't get I don't get uh, nailed too much in it. No, we were uh, uh, in between uh, some league. So we're, a group of us were over there um, at the invited Joey right um and joe is over there scouting the nba summer league and also an invo- invited coach to one of the um moments that was uh, associated you know is on when the summer league is on um he in fairness when we were looking to recruit someone he never gave us the heads up that he actually had some inside running on some guys who were actually playing in the summer league so we were of the opinion that we in these tournaments and this is where the guy is going to come from that we picked anyway um in between days of doing that, obviously we go out and have a um, to eat and a few laughs, and uh, we uh, came across this uh, advertising. Sorry, we, we went to an establishment for uh, for a meal, and uh, Reese Turner, who was Big Joe's right hand man at the time, uh, up here, and then subject the 36ers, said, "Oh, I've got a friend over here from Adelaide, and um, somehow he's hooked up with this, you know, uh, kind of I don't know rap group." And they were having this huge CD launch at the um, at the one of these huge casinos uh, around a pool pool party. And he said, "Oh, there's a table there and whatever else. If you guys want to come," and I said, "Oh, that sounds fantastic. But yeah, that'd be great." Or whatever. Anyway, we kind of looked on Insta, and there was the uh, advertised launch, and it had no uh, hats and called James. Stash man uh, with us, and he only wears a hat. He wears a hat to bed, so he, he was like, "Well, there's no way I'm taking it off." And then it had uh, no chains, no you know Nike logos, no this, no that. And, uh, I'm starting to what's ticking over my mind is what I've seen on telly with all these pool parties, with all these glamorous women and all these amazingly toned blokes around a pool, all dancing and doing it. And I'm starting to go through my head. I just don't know. At 100 kilos and 46 years old, I don't know if I'm really going to fit in in this kind of scene. And I, so I kind of oh look, I reckon I might give it a miss. Like, but you, you guys by all means go. And then kind of you had a bit of a think. And he's starting to think, oh, shirt off and dancing around. And he's like, oh, I don't know. I don't think my go. So he bails. And then Stash Man and the guy with the hat, he's like, well, I've, I've, I've got to keep my cap on 12-7. You know, so I'm out. So then it just leaves young Reese and and his uh, mate was there from Adelaide, and then they, and he his mate said, well I'm not going if it's him, I'm not, just the two of us are going. I'm going to look like a couple. <laughs> and so in the end, no one went to this. So next morning, these pictures go up on Insta from Reese's mate, and it's this unbelievable thing. And he had a uh, kebab there with us with all bottles ready to go and all this kind of stuff. And in the end, we were all just kicking ourselves we didn't go just for the experience, but. And Reese has never let us. No, we said, "Oh, you could have still went." And he been filthy from that day forward about, you know. So that's what you get when you hang out with all these old blokes who are uh, self-conscious 
their body image. And uh, yeah, so he didn't get the go. But we saw the photos the next day. Like, what were we thinking? Why didn't we go? Uh, you know, so yeah, it was a good story. And uh, and every time we see Reese, he never lets us live it down. So, but Biggie's uh, now of the opinion now he's had this last round of surgery that we shall reconvert back in Vegas in the next couple of years, and he'll be to go to the pool party. So uh, we're all we might all have to start trying to get in a bit more a bit more scope. Yeah, I'm sure. So, I'm, yes. sh- I'm sure he he will. That is a good story too. The amazing thing that I've learned from talking to all you guys um, in recent weeks is how many stories that this is why I like doing what I'm doing is it's bringing stories that people aren't privy to because the mainstream don't cover this stuff no one's speaking to this stuff or if they are talking they're only talking for five or ten minutes sort of grab on on all the common stuff it's actually this is why people do sport it goes well and truly beyond the, it's the shenanigans that go on behind the scenes yeah. that, that you know bring memories and and shared memories for you guys, and um and, and they are things that you quip about every so often. So Reese will hold you to account, and Joe yeah, absolutely Joe absolutely. won't forget I, the, the Tim Tam and, scenario. And just looking at your, I think looking at some of your stuff, and you can see in your kind of development as coach and what you're doing, and you kind of go down that road now. Of different things are now important. You know, when you start, you know, win loss, and you want to you, know, you want to win championships, and you want to do all this stuff, and then kind of as you go on, you start to realise, well, that's not really the be all and end all. That's not no no one really cares who won the women's league championship in 2013. So it was great at the time and whatever else, and but as you go along, you start realising the things you remember, are kind of those sort of stories. But the things you take pride in are you know, some of the kids you've coached. I've had kids now that have gone on. I've got a young lady who's back here in Darwin who's now going to be a, uh, a surgeon in seven years. You know, this these are the kind of things that you're proud of and that you're um, pleased you were a part of in a small way as kids, uh, you know, get older. And some of these kids have become my mates, you know, like they're, they're 29, 30 years old now and you coached them you know, when they were 15, 14, 16, whatever, and... Um, I think they're the things you take pride in. Certainly, the you know the Abby Cabillos of the world um, to have been able to play a role in her development as a young person's terrific. And you know, I think it, at times you know we we kind of sell ourselves short here a little bit. Like we sat down not too long ago and did a bit of a list of you know players that have gone on from the territory. And what happens is most people don't realise because these kids had to go somewhere else next to achieve the next thing. They don't actually realise the territory for kids. Yeah, you know, now the stories there. There's, there's so many kids that have gone and done things in another state that, that they've all their you know early development was done in the Northern Territory. And I think we we do a poor job of telling stories. Um, and, it, and I know at BNT it's something we kind of want to address. Just a, the problem with a, a project like that is you start making a list and then you leave it down, or you miss someone or and then. Then the drama starts, but I just there's I could roll off nearly 20 names of kids that have been through our programs in the last 15 years that have gone on to do something great either in the game or as a as a person in you know society. Um, and I think now that like being in this role, it's really opened my eyes to because I'm not coaching at club level, um, and I'm I'm one of the most competitive people ever meet. But I think you kind of just start to understand what's kind of really important a little bit. And, um, yeah, but it's when, when you're young and you're going into it and you're into it and you're competitive and all that kind of stuff. It's amazing how your kind of eyes open and your priorities change a little bit. Yeah. Shout out to Paul Foss, speaking of not worrying about championships and things, because uh, he loves the championship he got with the <laughs> women's NBL oh, um, as, te- yeah, yeah. as their tech, yeah. uh, as their video guy. Good so fan. shout out to yeah. shout out to him, um, Allison, a player I know. Um, Lee Lee Coffee or Leah, sorry, Coffee is um, one of the parents of one of the athletes that I'm working with. But uh, look, it, it's one of the things. Um, it's amazing how as you get older, your perceptions of what's important actually changes. Because you know, what Darwin did for me, and this is gonna, and this is, a, this is a true story. I was responsible. Like I, I was a competitor until in Darwin, I had to buy trophies for all the juniors. Because I'd never had to do that before, so those operations, I I literally um, ordered all these bloody trophies, and when I saw they were five or six dollars, 
and I didn't realize how many I, I thought I could have like my, my brain and perception of what I was playing for just dissipated and I'm, you know you're playing for a bloody six dollar truck that's what you walk away with and it's what you did like no, no one like I can never remember the game the, the seasons that I never won and I can't even remember the ones that we won like half, half of them yeah. like if you get to the higher levels I'm sure and you got a nice ring I'm sure it matters but at your domestic yeah. level and you and you you know I think I can't even remember. I think at uh, BSQ, I think we got some placing that I can't remember. It's like third. I don't even remember. But that's that's the point. It doesn't yeah. mean as much. It yeah, doesn't mean anything. It only means I mean, something we, to the people that win. You know. Yeah. Look, I, I mean, when I was coaching in Clan, I got into coaching at league level. Um, I had an unbelievable team um, uh, at Tracy Village Jets of female players. That were just a terrific group of people, um, but. Uh, Abby Cabell in the early days was, was one of those kids. Um, and we won 10 championships in a row. Uh, and we, you know, we won. I, I struggled. I was making stories up to try and get a rise out of the players um, because we scrimmaged so hard at practice. 90% of the games we won, we'd won before we walked in the door. Um, and I just had a great player, a really good leadership group. Um, so it was a really enjoyable experience from the outsiders. I'm not seeing people to come to training and all that garbage. Um, I had a really good leadership group. We won a lot of games. The ones I remember the most are the ones where our two leaders were injured in a, in a semi-final and I had for a 15-year-old Carol Oden and won us a championship. That's the one I remember, not because we won a lot, but what that meant to the group and what, how those young people went to the talent. They're things that were I remember now. You know, I don't, I don't remember eight of like you. Talk, I couldn't know who we played in. You know, eight or nine of those finals now. Um, but I remember the, the relationships formed with all those players, and I still have relationships with all of them. And so they're the things that need to be kind of important. You have to learn that. I think you have to mm. go through that journey to under, then understand. Okay, now I get what's really important. Um, so uh, I, I just. It's not till you've gone on that journey that you kind of realise um, it's important. Um, if I get the opportunity to coach at the next level, it'll be really interesting to see if that holds true because then winning becomes a real factor. Yeah. In my day-to-day -day job, development of people and players is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they're going out in club land and winning every game. To be quite honest with you, I don't really care. Um so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is an interesting journey and it teaches you a lot. Um, and, I, you know, ultimately you understand, like you said, the relationships that you form and the friendships that you develop are far more important than any $6 trophy. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's about you have to go through it, I think, to, to really understand that. Yeah, so it's interesting you saying it because it's certainly my experience as well. The intriguing thing is now is I'm... I'm wanting to win because I'm sick of losing, and um, and 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 I'm developing athletes, and I can see their potential, and there's certain things that I need them to do, and we've improved over the course of the last couple of seasons. So I've got young guys playing in a senior comp. When COVID hit, right. we were sitting third, and I've got out of eight athletes, I've got seven averaging in double figures, and they're playing like right. a team, and um, and and they're playing against men and veterans, and you know, it, to me, I know the trajectory they're, that they're on they I think the oldest yeah. is 22 playing veterans who are 36 and they're but they're players like they're men these are coming yeah. into their becoming men and um but now at a point where I'm saying to these guys if we don't win something like like we are we got to be driving and competitive now because and they're starting yeah. to this is the thing is they're actually yeah. starting to compete and that's the one thing I can't understand Understand, um, about this generation and maybe it's just my team I've got some really nice kids and really good guys in this group but um, there's for me there's no like mongrel or com like I, I don't understand how I, I I think I told the story last week where I said to a player um, I looked at him and I said if I punched you in the face right now what would you do and all the players are thinking of having a go at him and I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to explain I mean like what this team's doing to you guys and you're not punching them back is like yeah, but um, the look of yeah, yeah. horror on the teams when I said if I punched you in the face right now they thought I was upset at my point guard I was like no 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 I mean <laughs> so, I'm not trying to make a point you got to make a point so, so even after you know 30 years of coaching I still say the wrong the wrong thing but, look when I think you're right I don't think stories are any different to the majority of the kids here that you know we don't want to 
them to go out and hurt people, but we want to have a bit of mongrel about what you do. And the best kids I've coached all have had that. Um, Abby Cabello, Jordan R. Sam, Claire O'Brien, just kids that have got grunt about them. And in girls, it's even harder to find, um, to be honest. And I'm not trying to be sexist or whatever else. Mm. But all that I've found over my 25 years of coaching, largely um, coaching females, um, has been those ones that have just got that unwavering competitive spirit have gone on and done terrific things. Um, so, yeah, like I, I just find that, yeah, kids more and more now, they're just, I don't know why, but they don't have it. It's not that they don't want to win, but it doesn't, doesn't, you know, they're not carrying a chip around on their shoulder about winning. Um, and I don't, it's a bad thing. Yeah. You know, like it's not the be all and end all. I get it. But, you know, and we kind of, with our state teams, because it's a passion of mine and it's a great show that we're on here, but, but, but like at the end of the day, Vic Metro can have 150 invited kids, but ultimately they got 10, we got 10. Five each on the court. Let's go. Like, yeah. that, you know, I remember last couple of years we've had Metro in our pool and everyone's like, oh, Vic Metro. And I'm like, that's just not the attitude. You want to play Vic Metro. Mm. Otherwise, mm. what are we doing here? Yeah. Like, we want to play the best. That's what Australian championships are about. I'm disappointed when we don't play Vic Metro. Mm -hmm. So um, just trying to get that, you know, have a bit of pride in what you do. Have a crack. There's no expectation. No one's expecting you to take a quarter off Vic Metro. So that's a challenge. And... So that's kind of my drive and passion. It really irks me when, you know, kids, you know, they kind of, I don't know, I just feel like if you're not going to have a crack or it's not something that drives you, then, you know, what, what, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but you have to reel it in a little bit. So You don't want to show <laughs> that you're defeated ahead of time. One of the things that I, I say to my athletes is, and, and I know, and I, I know I didn't do this as a player because I was just autistical and confident. Com <laughs> But um, I didn't look at anyone as a challenge and I never looked down the floor at the other end and thought, gee, I've got to guard that guy or have a problem with anyone that was at the other end. And I've got guys that are looking down the other end of the court and I'm thinking, oh, you know, this guy. And it's like, dude, they don't even know who you are. You could be Michael Jordan. They don't know who you are. So, yeah, so, why, exactly. make, so why give them the attention thinking that they're a great player when you've not even measured yourself against them? And yeah. and and you, they don't know who you are. Like they might not have the scout, room. like yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Or might not have scouted yeah. you at all. Like like so you I think don't that's start the great beauty of AJC's. It's it's the ultimate test for the junior kids um, to go. Doesn't matter where you're from. Go and put yourself against the best kids in the country, and let's see how we go. Yeah, you know, um, which is why you know I've many years, mate. I've had people say to me, "I just go away to these championships and go and get by everyone." That's okay. Um, not true, but okay. Um, it's not about that because if it was, we wouldn't go. Like, if we're only going to go because we're guaranteed of winning games, we're just, you know, what's the point? So for me, it's always been about, it's not just about the games and the results, it's about an experience for young people, locking in for a common goal, um, all the kind of discipline and team camaraderie it teaches you as a young person. They, you carry those things with you for the rest of your life. Um, and, you know, no greater challenge for Northern Territory teams to go away and compete against all these bigger states with bigger numbers to pick from and whatever else. But my thing is just at the end of the day, five, five, ten, ten, and go. Like, yeah. and, you know, no excuses. We do, we go on and compete and do the best we can. And you, and you never know. And um, you know, I remember probably, and you talk about games, you kind of do remember. And I couldn't tell you at this championship where we actually finished, but we played. Um, and you're familiar with Jason Iverson from yeah, up here. Yeah. He was around when you were here. Ivo was my assistant coach for the 18 Girls Championships, uh, and they were in um, uh, New South Wales country, and we played, and this used to happen a lot uh, by coincidence, apparently, but they, the home team would play the Northern Territory right after or right before the opening ceremony, and it used to happen all the time. So we played New South Wales country women, um, before the opening ceremony and the crowd was huge, they were coming to the opening ceremony and also they were rolling in because we're playing the NTC and that's going to be a shellacking. Mm -hmm. And we had our two best players for injuries into the tournament, so we didn't play them in practice games. We played a practice game, I think, against New Zealand when they were at Nationals back in the day, and we didn't play our two best kid and they we got shellacked a bit there in the practice game. And anyway, so we came in the New South Wales country game and just said, look, 
let's just roll the dice. Let's let's put these two girls in that, that we think they're good to go. We've kind of cushioned them through. Anyway, quarter time, we're up 12. And, you know, it's pretty good. You know, it's not bad. But, you know, we understand where we're at. And, you know, that, that's probably going to still up 10 or 8 at half time. And Ivan and I kind of go, well, that's, these are, this is a great launching pad for the rest of the tournament. Get to three-quarter time, we're still in front. And we beat New South Wales country in New South Wales country in front of a New South Wales country crowd that was there to see a shellacking and stay the opening ceremony. Um, and one of the greatest wins. And, I mean, our girls went to the change room and it was like we'd won a WNBL title um, and then came back out, photos under the bus, the whole thing. And people were like, oh, look at these people. I said, you know what? These kids are earned that. I don't care what you're saying. They're that excited. They've worked so hard. And so they're the kind of ones, they are, they're the sort of ones you do do remember. Um, but, yeah, that's probably one of the one of the best wins I've ever kind of been involved with. That's a great group and a great group of kids. I think from the perspective of the Northern Territory, so um, when I did the high school boys in 2001 and we played out of the at Brisbane, and what's interesting is when we came into Brisbane and were playing in the tournament, Ernie Dingo came in and said hello to all the kids and was shooting with those kids because a couple of the Dingoes were playing in the girls group at the time. And, um, yep. and he, they they all got to meet him, and he was a TV personality, and everyone in the stadium knows who Ernie Dingo was at the time on one of the shows, yeah. I guess, way or something. And um, and yep. he's and he's in the and he's in the stadium, and um, and everyone wants his autograph, and everyone's. But he was there to watch the NT team play, so he shoots yep. through. And then we had a couple of Indigenous kids from Nullumboy and also from uh, Springs, and Daryl White Senior comes in. And he's taking these kids to a Lions training. Um, so I yeah. asked for permission. It was all a surprise. He walks in and all, again, everyone in the stadium is all congregating because here he is and here's the boy. And they didn't know where they were going. And they got shot through to, to go and watch the, the Lions back in the day when they were like to back to back um, AFL yeah, champions. Awesome. You know what I mean? And yeah. the thing is, is the, they, we're going for basketball, but the things I'll remember are those yes. little things. And not only was that experience, like no one else was coming in. Like that was what was amusing about it is anyone that was sort of anyone came in to, to reach those kids. And that's because they understand that these kids don't get that every day. Yes, absolutely. You know, yep. the kids from yep. Nullumboy, the two Indigenous boys were athletic as all hell. Like a jump yep. through the roof, and they they didn't have exposure or the experience. But when they their experience, when they had you know um, the AFL or an Indigenous player come and show his time and show them what's possible, like that experience was yep. absolutely amazing and something that they'll remember for the rest of their life. Now I don't know where those boys are. They could well be yeah. playing AFL for all I know. I can't even remember yeah. their names, let alone pronounce them at the yeah. time. I must say, but um, but yeah. It's, it's, it's an intriguing thing to have that experience when you've come from a different perspective because what yeah, I don't think anyone... Right. People don't understand unless they've been there. I know how hard it was to try and train a team for nationals. I know how hard that was being in Darwin, and it was an eye-opener for me because anyone in regional towns, they're not at the same level or they're not starting um, with the same, I guess, I'll say the word privilege, but they're not starting at the same stock as everyone else no no because you couple that distance with you know basically being a large country town and having the number of members we do um they're not getting quality games of anywhere near ajc standard um week in week out you know so um you know that's that is the really tough part and we're constantly kind of trying to come up with innovative 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 ways to kind of work that out and what else can we try and do to try and at least give them some level of exposure similar to what they're going to get when they go away we got a shout out from shelly lambert there so that's a name no. i haven't heard from for a long time so well shelly, great story about shelly is um and you'd probably be able to again relate to this having been here and understand but we uh nationals last year I couldn't get a manager for the team. I, you know, I couldn't get a manager. And Shelley's got her own trucking company down there in, in Melbourne now. And her and I, she's uh, she's one of my kids' godmothers uh, and a great close family friend. And I just happened to be talking to her one day. I said, oh, what are you doing this week? Kind of, you know, the week coming up or whatever it was for the Nationals. She said, oh, let me check my diary. And she said, oh, I think I've got much on. <laughs> I said to her, wouldn't mind managing a team at Nationals by any chance, would you? 
she said, well, you got to be joking. Why? What, what's wrong? I said, I just can't get anyone to put their hand up. And she said, oh, look, you know, I'm not a great cook. And I said, look, we'll be fine. Like, I just need a basketball person that can look after these kids. And she said, oh, well, all right. Yeah, if you can't find anyone else, all right. I'll do it. And she own way, like, was just fantastic, you know, fell in love with the kids and fell in junior championships all over again, mm. did an amazing job. And her name down for the next year before we'd even had a trials for the next year. And um, so she just said, I just forgot. You just forget what the experience of Australian Junior Championships is and being around good kids and the fun it is and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, oh, it's nice she's listening. I'm sure she'll give me shit like I'm being on <laughs> my socials about the quality of my Darwin 10. Apparently the lighting. I'm trying to tell people it's the lighting. So it's, have you... Uh, yeah. Have you got anyone there you want to shout out to um, on your device? Because I've been shouting out uh, from my group. I don't know if they're all in the same group. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of non-basketballers, uh, Rory McDonald, who's in the west of Sydney, Barry Roberts, who's in Adelaide. They're all, all my non-basketball shit on me. Uh, Reese Turner is the one that's given me grief about my Darwin tan, which he thinks is hilarious. So, um, like, Reese is pretty much being painted here as a um, shitster, and he's probably pretty much on the money. Um, yeah, I know Jerron was listening, and uh, and I know Biggie said he was going to be on on as well. So, um, hello to all those guys. Um, so yeah, but um, yeah, that, the kind of uh, probably the only other thing that I thought we'd touch on because you talked about the challenges of remote, um, the remote regions and whatever else, and it is it is a challenge absolutely. And um, up here we do have the remote. The territory government has a thing called remote sporting vouchers. Um, every kid in the territory. Territory now gets a hundred dollars per semester to spend on sport, but in the remote regions, the money goes on number of kids in a region at school, um, and the local councils apply for sports to come in. And um, we've probably been to fifty or sixty communities in the last eighteen months to two years, where we go out, and we deliver clinics, and do some stuff with um, uh, local people on coaching and um, refereeing and things like that. But the great difficulty is obviously, you know, IDing a kid of talent out there and trying to get them in some sort of program or kind of maybe into the big smoke to try and get them on that pathway that exists um, is a real, real challenge. Um, and it's kind of one of the, the I think Peter Lonigan, who's one of my great mentors, has in, you know, said to us now a lot, there's different ways now to enter the pathway. It's not just the straight line anymore. You can come in from the side um, for different aspects now. Um, and so things like what Joel Carlu is doing with uh, Indigenous basketball there with, with his group uh, and things like, you know, trying to talent ID. We, we got some money and ran our first ever 3X3 NT championships up here early in the year prior to COVID. And we uh, we run a Southern Cup in Alice Springs for all the, region, uh, all the communities in the South. And then the the team that won the three x three portion of the Southern Cup, which is a three x three and five on five tournament with weighted points, uh, we covered travel for them to come to the three x three NT champs. Just as trying a way of getting getting some of these lads and young ladies identified to you know get them in on a pathway in some way. But it, the challenge of that is um, is really tough. It's really tough. When I think still we we've still got to come up with better in, innovative ways to be able to harness some of that talent to kind of get them onto our pathways that exist. Um, so we're kind of working on that. We've got some things in with government about developing remote academies. Um, we've got to have a sustainable situation where we have people in community that can run and develop those academies in communities. No, no point trying to have an academy and have one person from here going out there once every three months or six. It just doesn't work. We know that. So we've got to up skill immunity and then provide support um, which getting into these communities is expensive but um, we just just need to keep coming up with innovative ways to get these kids on a pathway and then get them into a high performance camp and get them get them on a Peter Lonigan you know just we just struggle with that and, it, and it's a not not a thing of priority we see it as a, something of a high priority and we just need to try and work more collaboratively with government to get more money to try and get these these structures in place um but it's a challenge you know it's a it's a big um location in the territory and to get around is expensive um but uh yeah it's kind of a 
they're kind of a bit of a bugbear of mine now that, you know, we've got this remote sporting voucher program, but it's really fly in, weaker clinics and out. Mm. Um, and we've kind of got to, at some stage, complement that with something that's more engaging, that's something that's more lasting than just rolling up for a week and rolling out. Um, and our guys do a great job when they visit and whatever else, but it's it's not a sustainable thing. Um, so we're talking about trying to develop some regional academies in our most where basketball is most popular. Um, and the East Arnhem region is our by far um, um, the basketball there is unbelievable, and the love for basketball is amazing. Um, there's a place in the East Arnhem region that's now uh, in the throes of building a twenty million dollar facility. Um, self-funded, I might add, not not government uh, handouts or anything like that. Self-funded, um, where they'll have a three-court facility, and yeah, you know, we want to try and punt with those guys to get in and complement that facility for the region, so that we, you know, you know, that's where the regional academy camps could be, for example, and whatever else. But it's a real challenge, mate. You you know, you've seen it. You know how big the place is. It's, it's really tough, but we got to keep battling to try and keep not just for talent id but just trying to give these kids that love our sport a little bit more structured stuff that they can commit to it's the sparsity of 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 area from one place to the next so a lot of people who don't have perspective um when i arrived in in the territory first thing i noticed was the diversity of cultures i really was yeah I didn't, my, my vision of what it was like wasn't the same as when I arrived, I must say. Um, but yep. what, what I identified was the, um, like, for us to play in a tournament, we travelled 1,800 kilometres to Alice Springs, which is the same distance from Townsville to Brisbane, to play in the championships. Um, yep. And then, and the thing is, we only got to see each other twice a year. And that was our, it wasn't just rep, it was the championships. And it's like, yep. here, it's like you've got in the small space of, say, the size of Darwin, you might have three or four associations in that same yes. city. And, and they're getting to play each other every weekend, plus all the others on the periphery of them. And, and it's just like, you arrive, you go, it's not surprising, but the regions and the communities, um, the Indigenous communities, there's some talented and athletic kids there. I saw that yes. way like 18, 19 years ago when I had the yeah. opportunity to select a, a Northern Territory team for the high school boys. And I was, you know, I think I had three or four Indigenous youth in that team and they were picked on their abilities at the time. And there was probably other kids that could be picked based on roles, but... They deserve to be there, but they didn't have the exposure that kids in our community, like in suburban in cities. In yeah. yeah, and yeah, if you can get the programs and you can get the structures in place, and it's it comes down to re it's always resources. So yeah, venues, yeah. balls, and coaches. That's it. It's one know. of the great frustrations of my um, job, to be honest with you, mate. Like I love what I do, but you know, right now we've got two point six staff at Buswell Northern Territory, a CEO, myself, and someone that's on 0.6 of an hour, a 0.6 of a full-time equivalent. And then we've got a couple of contractor guys that do our, you know, go out and do the clinics and stuff in the remote regions. So it's very, very hard to, you know, ha have the financial backing to be able to do some of the lasting legacy pieces we want to do in remote regional Australia. Um, and, you know, it, it's frustrating for me today, but it is the reality of it. And, I, you know, I talked to you about at the start of our chat, about looking from the outside in and going, well, why aren't they doing that? Why don't they have an academy there? And what, being on the inside now with the understanding of the scarcity of resource, um, you can see why. It's not because yeah. people don't want to do it. It's because the reality of it is you've got to weigh up the scarce resource and try and get as much bang for buck as you can. Um, and, that, and that involves tough decisions, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, it's better. It's not a battle we'll give up on. I know our, the Board of Basketball NT is acutely aware consistently that it's an area where we've just got to keep driving and striving, trying to do better. Um, I'll tell you a story, and I know you had uh, Cal and CJ on. Um, when I first came into the job, uh, we decided that we would do this. Uh, um, they were going to have an NT champs, and they told you know, remote and regional and territory the NT champs were going to be on. And they're going to be in Darwin. Um, that was great. Anyway, as it turned out, for whatever reason, administratively and whatever else, the thing was just falling apart and people were pulling out. And there was all sorts of dramas. And the decision was made not to have the NT champs. So 
what I said in my early, you know, first few weeks in the job. I was like, well, this is just not right. We've got communities that have booked buses, paid accommodation. They're coming. Like, they, they're they looking forward to it. They've been training for it. We can't just, we just can't pull the plug. We've got to do something. And I said, oh, will you come up with what you think we should do? So um, I gave it some thought, and it was one of the topics I talked to Big Joe about. And, you know, we came up with this idea, that, look, we need a name for this thing to give it some punch so that the local kids will stay engaged in Darwin and the remote kids are going to get a unique opportunity. So who could we get? And, of course, Biggie just opens up his phone. He's got three quarters of the NBL playing community in his phone, at, you know, right away. And he said, oh, what about CJ Bruton? I said, oh, I'd love to have CJ. He won't come. to." It was over Easter. Mm. So he had to give up his Easter to come. And I said, oh, look, yeah, CJ, there's no way CJ's going to come. Like, you know, it's Easter and family and whatever else. He goes, just leave it with me. <laughs> so straight on the phone to CJ, mate, how are you going? Look, this is what's going on. This is what's happened. We just need a big name to come in and really work with the kids and excite them and whatever else without even hesitation. Um, CJ's like, yeah, I'm there. When's it on? So, oh, mate, it's in 10 days. It's over Easter. You should, yeah, absolutely. Book me in. Get me flights. I'm there. Mate, he he was here. Um, he <laughs> he missed his plane <laughs> to start with. So he actually had his medal. He brought his medals and his NBA jerseys and all that kind of stuff to show all the kids. And um, his bag was oversized and they wanted him to check the bag. And it had, like, his Commonwealth Games medal and, you know, this stuff that was very, very dear to him. And he's just like, well, I'm just not checking that. And now it's too late. Whatever. So, anyway, we got through that drama. We went on another plane. Uh, the thing started at 9. He got here at 11.30. And, like, hey, you going, man? Good, you good? Yeah, I'm all good. Literally walked through the glass doors. Said, what's going on? I said, we've got five courts going. We've got four different age groups. We've got 147 kids. He's like, right, problems, leave it with me. And he went, didn't hang around in the air conditioned courts, went straight out on the back courts over on court five in the 35 degree heat inside in the humidity and just went to work mm. with those kids with his amazing energy. It was just, I'll never forget CJ what he did. One, to just commit and come, but the job he did, like, it was just fan. And those kids just loved every minute of it. And it was the best decision we ever made. Um, and I, like I said to Biggie, mate, I just appreciate And the whole thing was a massive hit. But the, the sub story to it was, was we had a group coming from about eight hours away in a troopie. And um, they rang me up the morning of, uh, and oh no, the night before it was going to start and said, look, we've broken down, um, but we're going to be there. It doesn't matter if we're late because we're going to have a bit of a 3x3 tournament. And I said, no, absolutely not. Just come in. We'll work out when you get here and we'll get it done. It's not a problem. You just get here. Right, I know worries. They got the troopy repaired. They came to a river crossing and the river was up. Couldn't get across this river because it was uh, tail end of the wet. Um, and he rang me on a sat phone and said, mate, look, we're going to miss the first day. Is it a drama if we come for the second day? And I said, look, absolutely not. Um, as it turned out, they got across. They had to wait for the river to go across. They got here. They drove another six hours. They got at five o'clock. So the thing was finished. He rang me, rang, rang me from Catherine. Said we're three hours away and it was clock. I said, mate, we're we're kind of fishing it. We're done at three mm. thirty. The thing, whole thing's over. And he said, oh, that's all right. No worries. We'll keep. I said, look, just let us know when you get here. How you going and whatever else. So they get here. They go to their accommodation. He rings me. It's about six thirty in the evening. And um, anyway, I was telling CJ the story and we grabbed a quick, you know, I said, oh, we want to, we're going to look after you. Take you and have a nice meal before you get on your plane at 1 a.m. Anyway, the guy rang and I said, oh, so this is what's happening with him, CJ, and whatever else. And he goes, mate, just cancel dinner. Let's let's go. Let's get them on court. Now, I'm not joking. They bounce out of this troop carrier. These kids that have been traveling probably, well, they'd slept on the side of the road while the thing had to get repaired. Got out of that troop carrier with the biggest smiles on their face, Thought the DBA stadium most amazing thing ever seen. It'd be like us walking into Kudos Bank Arena or the Perth Stadium or whatever. And CJ was straight into them. Righto, guys. Like, and just CJ and CJ, two and a half, three hour session. I said, CJ, mate, I'm going to stop. It's 10 o'clock. These kids <laughs> travel for 15 hours. Like, you know, they got to they gotta get home and get some rest. So I and so we did that. And, um, and then, you know, we went to the airport with CJ and got him back on the plane. But 
just an amazing experience and that Bruton family are ridiculously amazingly good um and uh yeah it was you know I'll never forget that experience and all the Darwin kids had a ball but to see these remote kids that had traveled so far to have such a great experience um it was just awesome it was fantastic it's, yeah it's what what you're talking about again is coming back to that word experience for the kids in the NT there is their experience and like yeah. even just walking into the stadium and never having experienced something like that to then experience yeah. and then then to have a CJ Bruton experience on top of that. So um, yeah. absolutely, it was it was absolutely a, a, a I will say an honour to actually speak with um, not only CJ but his dad Cal on the show yeah. on the episode of live streaming with friends a couple of weeks back. Um, and and the main reason that is is when I got to with CJ, CJ um, and some of the bullets behind the scenes are very supportive of what. I do actually. It's not behind the scenes because because everyone knows that they're supportive. So it's it, they are supportive yeah. of basketball in general, not just myself, but a number of associations, academies, clubs, whoever. They're just, just very open. You discovered discovered that. But the the thing is, is when I connected with him and said, "Hey, do you want to be on the show?" He said, "I'd love to be on the show, but I'd really love to be on the show with my dad." And I said, "I said." we'll make it happen normally i do one yeah. guest but i'll try and work yeah. what i can we'll see i'll do some testing to see if we could get two of them up together in the way we did and um and and it, it, it really was good because i didn't understand the full story of calvin and i thought and i don't think people don't tend to tell people's story like they don't get to tell their story themselves they just i think people shame people so that story you've yeah. shared of cj is another story added to the legend of CJ Bruton. I know with CJ, I've got a number of stories and experiences that are special to me based on, you know, the experience I've had with him. So he, he, that's yeah. the amazing thing of the Bruins, and not just them, most people, even you, the people like yourself that I speak to, is you are contributing to a lot of people's broad experience in sport. Yeah. And I don't think it's fully comprehended, and sadly, until you're gone. I lost a friend who was an assistant coach last year, I don't think anyone realizes what people in any part of your life, whether it be sport or not, mean to you until you lose them. And then that's when you realize the value of, of who they were and who they are. So the right now for, for myself is I get to speak to someone like Calvin and, and even yourself where people can comment in a group and group chat and actually say what a legend he is. And people get that yeah. feedback. And it's not why they do it, but I think it's important no. to recognize it. Definitely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. So I might give it a little bit of a wind up. I do because we're getting on and I'm not sure what time it is there in the Territory. You're half an hour behind <laughs> us. So um, I remember that. I remember it was half an hour behind us and four four hours flight and I'd lose it, lose time and I'd go that way. I just, I'm like, what? I said, I just I arrived and I'm how, I just messed with my head. So best thing I ever did was fly back. I got a cheap flight back to Darwin on New Year's Eve because no one else was flying and we were over right. over the top of like the border of Queensland and the territory heading for me heading back to Darwin and um and the and all the flight attendants with Virgin all the flight attendants and everyone just we, we basically all celebrated New Year's Eve on the plane together and they they stopped working for about half an hour and they'd sit and we were all chatting and there was probably five on the plane and three or four yeah. um and even the pilots would obviously take turns i hope but they were coming out and greeting us and congrats you know well, you know that was a good that was an unusual experience because not too many people yeah. i imagine would fly new year's but being the tight ass that i am <laughs> i decide i decide i don't drink so i thought i could i could survive not going to the you know to the to um yeah, yeah. A, a New Year's Eve, go. I'll, I'll fly back to Darwin and get home. The, the funny story there is, I actually had to make it into my house because <laughs> because oh, because I um I'd left the I, when I flew to Brisbane. I didn't realise somehow I'd um I think I locked these in. Oh yeah, that's right. I locked the keys in my car. Um, and I didn't realise that at the time because I went to the taxi and then I got there and I couldn't find my keys because I never I hadn't needed them. I looked. Car down my break into my house to get my spare set. So I caught a taxi like at one a.m. to get to get to to and I'm and people are having parties around me and here I am pulling louvers out of my 
house getting in through the window. Got back in the cab, drove to my car so I could unlock it just to get home. I think I, I think we got home at about like I don't know, like got got to bed at about three that morning. But I'm thinking all these people are partying behind me, and I'm thinking here I am breaking into my house, and surely they can see me, and they're not saying anything. But anyway, I, I was winding up there, but they just threw me back to the story of um of, of breaking into my house on. New, Year, New Year's Eve. Um, but look, mate, it's been a pleasure catching up and hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime. If you are in my neck of the woods, I do run Oswish Academy, as you know. Um, I'm yep. more than happy for you to come in and, and share that experience yep. and um, you know visit some of my athletes and give them a taste of the Rod Tremlett treatment. So Love to do, Love um, to do that. You're, you're more than welcome. Um, but thanks for your time. To all those watching across the Northern Territory tonight, uh, try to make sure everyone's represented so if you're watching thanks um for being here anyone else across australia who's watching thanks for being here and joining us on people with a passion live and with friends don't forget to check out the people with a passion youtube channel we have 35 interviews up there that uh pre-recorded we have about ten, i think you're the 10th now live stream that we've done right so um we've spoken with the brutons we've spoken with uh who have i spoken with joey wright rob beverage jason Kadee, Mitch McCarron last week. Um, so, you know, there are guys and basketball people that you might be interested in having a look at if you're a basketball person uh, and yep. do appreciate that. So subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you like the Facebook page. People with a passion, if you're watching on there, make sure you like that. Um, I'll leave you with a, a quick word right before we go. Um, something you might want to say and and then I'll be yeah, a good think, night. I think um, for me, you know, being a remote region, um, I guess, in relation to the rest of Australia, you know, anything's achievable. I think uh, you put your mind to it, and you know, we've had some great examples with young Territorians going away and doing, doing great things. Could have been easy for them just to say, "Well, it's all too hard because I'm from a place that's small and doesn't have the competition and whatever else." And but I think that idea of following your dreams and working hard to achieve them is really important. Um, and it doesn't matter where you're from um, to take your opportunities, and if you do have a dream engage people that will help you get there um and and chase hard you know um people make their own luck so um don't sit you can hope something comes to you go and chase it work hard to achieve it that would be kind of my message and it is my message to the kids here so one of the things is um the saying around luck is luck is where um what is it opportunity um meets something <laughs> for goodness sake yeah, yeah, I do know. What you're about. Yeah, yeah. opportunity. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, luck is where opportunity. Oh, it means preparation. So yeah, luck yeah. is where opportunity meets preparation. So you got to have those two things, and that's what luck equals. So um, I absolutely yeah. agree with you. So thanks for your time, mate. Thanks for everyone that's Thank joined you. us tonight. Um, look after yourselves, and hopefully we'll be back in the swing of things in a few weeks with uh, with COVID behind us, and we're all back playing basketball. Take care.